Welcome to the final installment of the lecture videos for Finance for Managerial Decision Making. And we're going to wrap up by taking a look at cash management. Very important topic for businesses large and small. The question is, how much cash should a firm keep on hand? This is really an economic question. We don't want too much or too little. And if you hearken back to when we talked about working capital management, this is a really a related issue. The idea is you want to optimize. You want to get it just right because there are costs and benefits to cash. We want to balance them. Okay, so the minimum is to keep enough cash to make the payments that we need to make. But on the maximum side, we want to think about limiting cash and investing extra cash in securities, interest earning savings accounts, CDs, treasury bills, or things of that nature that would earn us a little bit of return in the short run. Okay, so let's focus on that minimum side for a minute. The size of the minimum balance depends first on how quickly and cheaply we can raise cash when needed. If we have excellent credit and we know that the bank will give us cash tomorrow if we need some extra cash, well then we can go ahead and ratchet our minimum down. If we're a young company, we don't have really good credit and we might have to pay a high interest rate or go through an approval process so we can't get a line of credit tomorrow, well then we're going to have to keep a larger cash buffer. How accurately can our managers predict the cash requirements? If we have a really solid idea of the timing of cash inflows and outflows, we can go ahead and minimize current cash and then we can make the adjustments as needed. If it's very unpredictable, we're going to have to have more cash as kind of a buffer or a cushion against those uncertainties. And then precautionary cash. If we are worried about emergency uh, cash needs, that of course is going to lead to having a larger cash buffer on hand right now. Okay, then on the maximum side, we're going to be thinking about what investment opportunities are available and what are the rates of return on them. Okay, so we can look at things like money market funds, uh, investing in short-term bank CDs, commercial paper, um, money market mutual funds, by the way, typically invest in commercial paper, and commercial paper, that's just uh, really short-term bonds. That's um, something like 30 or 60-day corporate bonds. That's like the corporate world's version of treasury bills. Expected return, if interest rates are relatively high, it's going to be more attractive to hold these short-term instruments, these short-term securities. Uh, if interest rates are relatively low, it's going to be less attractive. So we might decide on a smaller cash balance when interest rates are high. There's more earning potential with cash or, or you know, very liquid type investments. And then finally, a transaction cost of withdrawing cash and making an investment. And here we think about you know, what's, the, what's the cost of processing a payment, writing a check, mailing checks, or, or dispersing payments uh, through online banking networks. And then typically some kind of commission or fee when we're buying securities. So there are some costs. They might be pretty small. Um, they, they're probably smaller today than they've ever been due to our advanced um, payment processing networks, but they're still there. So we have to think about that, and that's going to prevent us from shuffling cash around too frequently. Okay, so when we chart out the trend of our cash balance, you know, this might be our, our corporate checking account. Here's dollars in the account on the vertical, and then the days of the month are ticking by, 1 through 30. And you can see that the cash fluctuates with inflows and outflows, sometimes unpredictably. Okay, and basically what a cash management procedure does is says, let's kind of put a floor on what we think we, we need to always have there as a minimum. You know, and that might be, uh, depending on the size of the business, the magnitude of the uh, transactions, you know, we might say we need to always have a minimum of 10,000. Larger business, that might be in the hundreds of thousands. And then the, the ceiling, we're going to say, we don't want to keep more than this, and you know, maybe that's 20,000. And when we get above 20,000, we're going to peel off that extra money and go ahead and invest it. Likewise, when we get below our minimum, we're going to go ahead and use some kind of uh, financing method to fill. So we're, we're going to you know, maybe have a line of credit with a bank. We'll tap the line of credit to make sure if when we start going below, we get right back there and we stay roughly at or above our minimum. You kind of think of this, this as a, a, a kind of a corridor mechanism for cash management. And this is a pretty standard procedure. Okay, now the next thing we want to address is forecasting cash needs and developing the cash budget. And this is a pretty involved procedure, so I, I want to move through it kind of quickly and just kind of touch on the highlights. We're not necessarily going to do this in depth uh, in the homework problems. We might do something just um, basic, but I do want us to get a feel for this procedure. This is a pretty important aspect of financial management. This isn't uh, the glamorous side of finance, you know, with um, investments and and capital budgeting and all that. But uh, this is just the day-to-day -day work of financial management to keep companies operating and functioning smoothly. Okay, so we need to develop a cash budget to determine the monthly needs and see if there's going to be any cash surpluses or shortfalls that we need to um, to accommodate. 
We look at timing of inflows and outflows and recognize the fact that our payments are typically going to be delayed after receipt of goods, of inventory, merchandise, materials. And also the receipts on our own sales are also sometimes going to be delayed if we're offering credit, letting people um, pay sometime after the sale was made. So here's an example. We have this company Rocky Mountain Climbing and we have uh, some sales history here. We're, we're at the end of the year in 2015 so we've got a few months worth of sales history here. Then we're forecasting for our next uh, four months. For some reason we have a big jump in February. You know, maybe that has something to do with people getting ready for the spring season. So you got to know that seasonality of your of your business, of your sales, and build that into the forecast. Okay, and then here's uh, expectations regarding our collections of sales. 30% pay cash, so that's going to be instant cash inflow. 50% pay a month after sale. We give them credit. We allow them to, to pay within a certain time frame. 20% pay two months. You know, these might be customers that are having a little cash flow problems of their own that they have to delay the payment. So. With those things in mind, we, we know that we're going to have some staggered cash inflows and we can put that into our cash budget. Okay, some other details, and there's a lot of details that we have to kind of assemble before we do this budgeting process. Per when our own purchases of inventory are 75% of sales, this is how we replenish. We make those two months before the sale, pay for them one month after delivery. Uh, we have some overhead here, 14000 per month, and then taxes due once per year or once per quarter probably in March. Here's our starting cash balance going into the next year and the minimum required by bank. This might be something that uh, if we do have an interest bearing checking account, and our book mentions that it's, it's pretty rare to earn interest and that's true in, in checking accounts that do earn interest earn a pathetically low rate. That's why I want to keep the, the balance in there to a minimum and then shuffle out any excess funds into interest bearing securities. Uh, right now on decent savings accounts you can get something north of 1%. And while I'm talking about interest rates, I figured I would show you a couple little tools that are uh, really handy. One is uh, bankrate.com. And I actually look at this site all the time just because I'm curious about the path of interest rates. But I've actually also found uh, places to invest. So I'll click on the savings and checking here. And say, you know, we want a savings or a money market account to park our short term funds. And they will give us a listing of the current rates on uh, savings accounts. So here you go, 1.35% by CIT. I'm guessing that this is a strictly online bank. I actually have an account here with uh, GS Bank paying 1.3. It's about the best you can get. Strictly online bank. They don't have any branches, so they have really low overhead, so they can afford to pay more on their deposits. So um, bankrate.com, they have a lot more than deposit rates, but uh, really good source for current rates for all different kinds of instruments. You can see the savings, money market, CD rates, there's a five-year CDs paying 2.41%. Uh, this is November 2017. And then uh, there's lots of good financial news and information sites. I happen to be a Wall Street Journal subscriber. This is my main source for news. I read it every day. And I like the site because they have the stock market indices and, and treasury bond here at the top. You know, the treasury yields are rising a little bit right recently, almost 2.4% oil price, euro. They've got this little summary of market data so you can always just get a quick snapshot of that. But if you click here on the rates you get a picture of different bond yields and if you click through to markets we can get a more detailed picture of the structure of interest rates right now. You have all the different uh, T-bill yields. Here's our consumer rates, prime rate, mortgage rates, uh, average car loans. So get a good picture of where interest rates are. There are lots of good resources for that online so the bank requires us to keep a minimum they might penalize us if we go much below that but we don't want to necessarily go a whole lot above that because uh, it just doesn't pay to keep too too much extra money in the bank okay so we're gonna forecast our collections and other cash inflows forecast our outflows then summarize the net monthly effect and determine if we need to borrow or if we have a surplus that we're going to go ahead and invest. And with a lot of businesses, you're going to have both of those situations occurring at alternate times during the year. Sometimes our, our cash inflows are weak relative to outflows, so we're going to have to borrow to maintain our, our desired cash balance. And then other times we'll have a, a big inrush of cash and we'll have surpluses, so we'll go ahead and invest. Each month, the company collects cash from sales that have occurred in that month and the preceding two months. Remember, we kind of had that schedule of 
receivables. Some people pay right now, some people pay a month, some people pay two months out. Well, that means every month we're collecting from the previous month and two months ago. So for example, January sales were 120,000. We're gonna collect 30% of those in January, 50% of the December sales, and 20% of the November sales. So that's how we're going to establish our inflows for each month. It's a formula of fraction of this month's own sales and then the past two months. Okay, and then here's a map of what happens with the January sales. We collect 30% of those in January. So that's 36,000 of the 120. 50% the following month, so there's 60,000. And then another 20% finally two months out. So when we build a, a cash budget, we're typically making a timeline like this. We're gonna list all the pertinent uh, factors. First sales and then cash inflows. And then we'll put expenses and actual outflows. And then at the bottom of this, you'll see here in a, in a minute, We'll stack everything up, add the inflows, subtract the outflows, and then we'll have a month-by-month -month sequence of net cash changes. Okay, so now we're stacking up uh, not only the, the current month sales, but the sales for the other months. So in January, as we mentioned, we have that much from January, that much of December sales, that much of November sales we collect, so there's the total. Same procedure for February, for March. And we don't need to get into these figures too much, we just get the idea that we, we know, based on experience and based on these proportions, that uh, we're going to collect a certain amount based on that lag in collecting receivables for each period. Okay, and then likewise for the outflows. We, we said purchases are made two months prior to the sale and paid for one month later. So the January sales were purchased in November, but they're paid in December. So they represent an outflow for the, for the prior month. So when we're looking at outflows, this is what it's going to look like. Okay, and then these outflows are based on that uh, proportion that we mentioned. So again, it's a like procedure. We just uh, c calculate, you know, working forwards or backwards as needed, the payments made in each month. Add in all the remaining outflows. We mentioned we had overhead expenses that we're, we're estimating as pretty constant, 14000 per month. And then we can add all of the inflows, subtract all the outflows, and arrive at our net change in our balance each month. And we'll see that some months are going to be significant deficit balances. So what's going to have to happen there? We're going to have to probably borrow some funds or sell some securities to, to refill our cash coffers. Some months are going to be surplus. And in those situations, we can, we can re reduce debt. And if the surplus is enough to retire all the uh, current cash-related debt, we can go ahead and invest. So we can retire debt and or invest the surplus. And the book gets a little more detailed in that procedure if you're interested. I just don't feel the need to address it in depth right now. So we'll move on to a final aspect of cash management, which is a set of four rules for optimal cash inflows and outflows. We want to increase inflows, of course, during any given time period. And then we want to slow down outflows within reason, within, uh, within legitimate ethical boundaries. So the kind of mantra that we derive from that is to collect early on our receivables and pay late, as late as possible, as late as, as, uh, as is appropriate on our payables. Here's some methods to increase or speed up cash inflows. Or do more cash sales, of course. Um, increase the efficiency of our collection of credit sales. This is uh, one reason a lot of companies uh, accept credit cards, even though there's a fee associated with uh, receiving credit card payments rather than to issue credit on their own credit card company makes payment to the vendor within a short time period and then the credit card company or the bank issuing the credit card takes it upon itself to collect from the user of the credit card and as you know if you've ever had a credit card you typically have about 30 days to pay if you don't pay they're gonna start charging you interest on your balance so the credit card issuers uh, function as an intermediary between businesses that want to make more cash sales and customers that uh, want to maybe buy more than they, they really can in some cases, or at least um, spread out their payments over time. Okay, we can decrease or slow down outflows by cutting costs. We're always looking to do that anyway. Taking full advantage of time allowed to pay obligations. If you have accounts payable that are due in 30 days, you want to pay them as close to the end of that 30 days as possible before risking uh, go going late. If you do go late, you might incur some penalties. So you don't want to go late, but you want to go as, as late in the period as possible. And we can also speed up inflows by tightening up our own credit policy. 
Now, that's a matter of to whom are we going to issue credit. We want to be careful about this because if we tighten policy, we might actually lose some sales. So there's some costs and benefits associated with this. Only issue credit to really good credit risks. Um, they're going to be more likely to pay on time, so that will speed up the collection of receivables. But we might also lose some sales because we filter out some people with you know more marginal credit scores or, or credit profiles. But you know they might pay anyway, or you know nine out of ten of them might pay anyway. So balance a trade-off between losing sales due to over tightening credit and speeding up collections due to higher credit standards. Computerized fund transfers is becoming very common. Um, online payment processing speeds up the payment process tremendously. A lot of us are now using online bill payment with our banks where uh, the bank will electronically transfer funds to the larger companies, organizations. Even when the company that I owe money to doesn't cooperate in the electronic payment system with my bank, my bank will dispatch a check to them for free for me. So they can still, we can still do that old-fashioned uh, method of mailing the check. My bank handles all of the kind of the busy work on that, printing out the check, putting it in the envelope, putting a stamp on the envelope. So uh, it's a really convenient service that a lot of banks are offering now and a lot of people are taking advantage of. Using collection centers, using lockbox systems, these are just these are a little bit um, esoteric methods of increasing the efficiency of mailed payments. And we can slow down outflows, as I mentioned, by delaying payment of bills. And uh, using uh, remote disbursement banks, this is uh, a procedure known as float, floating your payments. And if you might remember from that little uh, video clip we watched from Catch Me If You Can, where the FBI agent was talking about the uh, Federal Reserve districts and how checks in each regional district of the Fed had that Fed number built into the routing number, and those checks would be sent to that Fed area for processing. This is a map of the 12 banks of the U.S. Federal Reserve. Slide. Nicker scanners at every bank read these numbers at the bottom of a check, slide, and then ship that check off to its corresponding branch. Carl, for those of us who are unfamiliar with bank fraud, you mind telling us what the hell you're talking about? The East Coast branches are numbered 01 to 06, the central branch is 07, 08, so on, so forth. You mean those numbers on the bottom of a check actually mean something? All of this was in the report I filed two days ago. If you change a 02, to a one two that means that check which was cashed in new york does not go to the new york federal branch but it is rerouted all the way to the san francisco federal branch the bank doesn't even know the check is bounced for two weeks slide if you could uh write a check in boston that was drawn on a san francisco bank that check would have to be sent all the way back to san francisco for processing now it doesn't have to be actually physically mailed anymore. And what happens often today is that images of the check are just uh, sent electronically. So the, the idea of float is kind of losing its relevance. But back in the day, if when the check had to be mailed, it would take maybe you know a week for the check to, to go from Boston to San Fran. And in that time period, uh, the money stayed in the issuing business's uh, checking account, and they therefore reduced the, the outflow of funds and they had what was called float so they could still actually maintain a higher level of investments whether in in the bank account or in securities and things of that nature and you earn money on the float the the money that's in process you know you and companies got really sophisticated at, at doing this and then electronic payment systems kind of kind of killed off the incentive because now it gets sent over here instantaneously okay so there's some uh, basics of cash management uh, nothing too complicated, but uh, still principles that are very useful and everyday financial management for big and small companies alike.